Hi everyone and welcome to a new episode of Swisspreneur. My name is Sylvan and I will be your host today. Today we're in Zurich and we'll have a chat with Iman Navi. He is a serial entrepreneur and he will talk about how he evolved from being a family business owner to a multi-million dollar startup company. His startup, Advertima, is an experience management system that got a lot of media attention when they started. He will talk about the journey, the challenges, and about the future of their company. Let's have a chat with Iman. Before we get started with the episode, I would like to introduce you to SBB Startup. If you think that your company is a good fit for the Swiss Railways, get in touch with them or learn more about their startup programs at spbstartup.com. Iman, very well and welcome to the Swisspreneur Show. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you very much. I'm really happy that you are here and I have the chance to talk to you. Awesome. Let me start with the first question right away. In 2010, you started Taxifrosch, a sustainable cab company in Switzerland. And you have also been working with your father. He was the CEO or still is the CEO of that company. Is starting a business with a family member or a relative to you something that you would recommend to others to do? It's not that easy to answer. Um, I, I think there are big advantages like, like trust and you can be sure that nobody is going to, um, to um, somehow bring you in a situation where you you think okay I can't trust this person I have to decide by myself the stuff but on the other hand uh, some some distance in business is also good I, I I would recommend to start businesses with uh, family members I have done this also with my brother he is one of the co-founders of Advertim as well mm -hmm. and um, but keeping the distance in business and not mixing the, the, the private part with the business part, that's important as well. Do you have any suggestion or recommendation how you can really separate these two of each other and actually not mix things up? Talk, talk in advance, uh, it's expectation management. Just okay. make the rules clear so uh, that the environment in business is different as at home. Uh, for example, in Advertima, my brother I am the CEO of the company. My brother is four years older. So this is a complete change. At home, he is, uh, he is telling me what to do in the job as well when it comes to hardware and stuff like that. But in the end, it's, uh, the, the last decision is always coming from my side. Okay. I can imagine this is a pretty difficult, the diff different roles that you have to play. That's probably not always easy. I don't know. Uh, I mean, we have been working together also in my second company, uh, Digital Delight, and we have done this. We have been doing this for the last eight years. Okay. So I can't remember the time when it was not like this. Okay. So it works very well. Awesome. How did you actually become an entrepreneur? Because before you were involved in entrepreneurship, you basically worked in the finance sector at Mirobank. What led you to switch the industry from banking to entrepreneurship to start? First of all, I was just the assistant of the chief risk officer. So uh, it was not like um, I was young. I was that was before I was 24 years old. So I can't say I was a banker. I was just fair point. Yeah. So um, I studied my bachelor's degree. I made my bachelor's degree in banking and finance at the University of Zurich. Besides that, I was just 40% working in a bank as the assistant of, in the risk office. So um, in this time, I realized that this is nothing for me. So I was basically at the university studying banking and finance, working in a bank. And every morning when I stood up, I knew I want to be on the other uh, side of the table. <laughs> I want to be the entrepreneur. So after my bachelor's degree at the University of Zurich, I decided to found a company, but as you know, as a business um, business student or banking and finance student, you don't have a lot of ideas for new businesses. So I was just looking around who, who is doing what and where can I uh, um, get an idea from to build a company. So it was clear my father was um, self-employed in, uh, in the taxi industry, so I asked him to uh, 
yeah, start the business with me. So for the first six months, he said no, because <laughs> if you go to university and uh, your father is very proud of you and he doesn't want uh, he, he, he doesn't want you to to end up in the taxi industry. So I convinced him afterwards and um, we started this business together. Cool. What actually made him or made you convince him what arguments, what points did he use to actually... I told him, him that it takes me just one year. Afterwards, I will go to university again. <laughs> it took me in the end two years okay. to build up this company. It always uh, takes longer, but that was the reason. So it was really fun. I learned a lot and that was also the reason that I started to my master's degree at the University of St. Gallen in entrepreneurship. So that was sort of, you liked what you were doing there and then you said you want to further develop your skills by a master's degree as well. Exactly. So there was uh, not a lot to do after one and a half, two years in this company. I mean, it's a traditional business, uh, not a lot of new ideas. And sure. afterwards, um, the decision was clear. I loved it to be uh, an entrepreneur and I made a good job. So I went to university and studied uh, entrepreneurship. Awesome. And then after your studies for the master's degree, you also started working at Startfeld in St. Gallen, a startup incubation program, also an accelerator. And there you supported early stage startups. You've seen many, many pitches and you've also worked and coached a lot of early stage startups. Are there any success factors or any common skills or common features that you could determine from looking at so many different startups that make a difference whether they make it or not? Actually not. There are, there are a lot of factors playing into this. And um, in the end, I think persistence is something very important. The idea itself is, is not that important, I think. It's more the plan that you have and the experience you have. So you can, after, I had more than, um, hundred different uh, coaches and uh, at some point you realize after 10 minutes if those people have experience or not so um, having people in front of you who were experienced in uh, building up businesses that was a big difference so they knew what questions to to ask and uh, what uh, problems to tackle and then two years later uh, after you started at startfeld you started your own company advertima the next one basically before you actually decided to focus on Advertima, you were testing several different business ideas, one of them a media agency that you also mentioned uh, earlier. How, how did you get there? How did you get, end up focusing on Advertima? And how did you also make a decision which project you should pursue? At the University of St. Gallen, I learned what, um, what, what uh, the Lean Startup means, for example. I read the book and we had a lot of... Um, courses about entrepreneurship, what is the difference between management and entrepreneurs. And um, I knew some stuff that I didn't knew before. So when, uh, when you start traditional businesses, you do some stuff completely different than um, when you start a startup. Like what, so, for example? I mean, that, yeah, if you build, um, if you, found, if you uh, found a new company in a traditional space, and uh, the business model is also traditional, then you have to, you had 100 years of experience from the market that you can just copy. You have to make better marketing, some uh, little adjustments to be better than the others. But a startup is like something completely new. So you don't know your customers, you don't know your, if your product is going to work on the market. So a lot of uncertainty. So the methodology is completely different if you want to be successful. Mm -hmm. And um, in the traditional space, you do, I mean, about 90% of what you do is already proven. So a taxi company, what is, what is the risk there? <laughs> it's uh, compared to what we do at Advertima, it's, it's small. And if you uh, found a web agency, you know exactly the product is a website, the, the, the market is here because people need websites. So it's not really fun for me to... So there is mainly a marketing game, but not a radical innovation. Yeah, it's, it's about knowing what, what the market needs and uh, 
that's the big difference in, in a startup. So I knew that. I wanted to, uh, after the master's degree at the University of St. Gallen, when I learned a lot about the theory of entrepreneurship and startups, I wanted to build a startup, a real startup to disrupt th uh, th uh, something and um, change stuff and uh, have the global potential, all this stuff that, uh, that uh, we are dreaming of uh, at the university, of course. And, um, and, and therefore I knew um, I don't want to risk a lot. So we tried out about five or six ideas, different ideas. Mm -hmm. we, with each idea, we even earned money. But we, we went really this lean startup way. And uh, one of the ideas was um, Advertima. And when one customer, after one and a half years of uh, prototyping, uh, one customer said, okay, he wants um, our product to be placed in a shopping center. Uh, we said, okay, can you pay in, in advance? And after some negotiation, he actually did. So, so he paid in advance and we knew, okay, this is the chance. So drop everything else and focus on Ad Advertima. And that was the beginning, end of 2015, cool. beginning of 2016. So if I understand that correctly, your decision was also certainly or to a certain degree made by the revenue amount that you could make in these testing periods. So Advertima basically made the biggest revenue in a short amount of time. And that also led you to focus on that one because now you pre-signed something. Now you also have to deliver basically. I think it was not the amount of, of, of the project. Um, it was... We didn't think about it, okay. how to choose. I, I mean, it was clear. It was not a decision to make. It was like, if somebody gives you that, um, I mean, <laughs> somebody's paying you a lot of money. You could, you could, um, there is no other way than just focusing on that. Yeah. So um, I wouldn't say that the other ideas wouldn't lead to success, mm -hmm. um, but we had to drop them because uh, we had to deliver something. So if I understood your question right, um, it's not the amount itself, it's, uh, it's the responsibility you have to, to the customer and you just promised something. Yeah. And uh, in the other cases, we just finished the stuff and uh, delivered and then uh, stopped selling. Did you also see the biggest potential in Advertima compared to, for example, an agency business? Of course, it was a product. You could, you could scale, it all, scale it all over the world. But um, to be honest, when I look back right now to the product we had at that time, that was a joke. Okay. Uh, that was um, <laughs> face and um, agent gender uh, detection on a tablet and the decision what content to show inside a taxi on a, on a tablet to the, to the passengers. And in the meantime, uh, when we look back, this was really naive to believe that we can go to the market and go global with this product. So the, I think key is really the, to, to, to stay dynamic and flexible and always try to get feedback from customers market and uh, change what you are doing to uh, something better. How did you get this feedback already when you were trying to sell a product or a solution to them or then also when actually implementing it or did you combine both of them? Uh, in the beginning it was just listen to the customer. I mean customer um, centric thinking. How did you do that in, in practice? Like, did you just call up companies that you think could no. use your, your product? Imagine this big deal with this customer that was paying in advance. Yeah. And this big deal uh, brought us enough money to found the company, pay salaries to new people, grow to 10 people. So you don't talk anymore to anybody else. It's just like, how should we deliver this to the customer? Because in the first meeting, I just promised him it takes us six months to bring this to the, <laughs> to, to the shopping center. This was, of course, bullshit. I didn't know it. So I went to our CTO and told him, I don't know what just happened, but uh, we have to deliver what we have right now on a tablet to a big screen of three big screens in a shopping center. So, and we have six months time. What was his response? Yeah, he was going crazy. He was like, are you stupid? We can't do that. And it was like <laughs> one week of fighting and doing it. But in the end, it took us about 11 months, okay. but uh, we delivered. How did you manage the, the expectations with that big client? Because if you promised them six months, at a certain point, they probably also want to see results, right? 
there must be a visionary guy on the other side of the table, innovative in, uh, visionary guy that, that is uh, ready to take the risk. So this guy is actually the early adapter or the innovator. Mm -hmm. So he's okay with that. So he will understand. Sure. So we were afraid, of course, but I talked to him and he was always like, um, um, yeah, patient. And he knew that, that this is going to take longer than six months, I guess, in the, from the beginning. But uh, to come back to your first question, uh, I think listening to the customer or focusing too much on the customer is it's, it's really bad. Okay. Yeah. So in the end, there must be two sides. The customer wants, wants you to solve his problems. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he suggests you some, some solutions like fancy interactive stuff is always good. And we were just saying, okay, if he's paying the money and uh, he wants it and he's the customer, let's build it. Mm -hmm. But not having a vision that fits or a strategy, long-term strategy, strategy that fits into the market trends and where the world is going is also not really intelligent. So in the end, after one and a half years, uh, we realized that we were building something for the customer because he spent a lot of money in it and he really wanted it. Mm -hmm. And it was not really a good idea because all over the world, other people were doing the same. And um, in the end, we at some point, we realized uh, if we really want to sell this to other customers, um, it's not going to be that easy. We tried it. We tried it. And in the beginning, we thought, okay, the other customers are going to pay the same amount of money, but they didn't. Okay. Then we uh, tried to sell smaller projects, but it was still too big for them. Mm -hmm. So then you realize basically, okay, this was really the innovator guy that um, it's, you, you can copy that again. Right. At that time, you start to think about the strategy and uh, having a big vision that fits. If you really want to go global, you should find your place on the, in the market. And it's not just about listening to one, two, three or four customers and just deliver whatever they want. So one of the components of our philosophy right now or culture is, yeah, don't, don't just listen to the customer and deliver him whatever he wants. Then you, you're basically going back to an agency business, sort of, right? If you would do it that way. Yeah, you can also build a product out of what you deliver to the first or uh, second customer. But this product is not uh, going to be um, scalable and not going to have USPs if you don't uh, care about strategy. How do you then develop from you know, realizing that you have a problem in that area or something that you need to work on? How do you then switch to creating a compelling vision and the good strategy to actually follow through, which you can then also use for sales and product development? Ah, yeah, that was, that was something really difficult because uh, you have employees and they are working on something. And at some point you stand up and say, okay, we have to change the stuff. And when you were hiring people, because we were growing very fast, because we, have, we had to deliver the stuff to the customers, um, we didn't even care about who we are we were hiring it was like um, culture that was something that we didn't know so startup mindset nobody cared about that it was like uh, just bringing in people who could do, do the job and mm -hmm. that was um, at some point when we started to change stuff very fast and being dynamic and realizing okay we have to uh, change the strategy as well we realized that uh, the majority of the people in the company were not able to do such stuff. They were coming from corporates mm -hmm. and they were not used to uh, change very fast. And uh, actually, they didn't even understand it. Why? It, okay. was, it was very difficult. A lot of talks, but in the end, that was the most difficult part, I guess, to, when it came to this learning from the, of course, the customer as well, but also from the market. Uh, doing research about trends, market trends and technology trends, and then starting to take those insights and learnings and knowledge to, to change the strategy. That was not the difficult part, the conceptual part, mm -hmm. the people were. Yeah. At the end, that's the backbone of your business, right? Exactly. So uh, when I could do something completely different from the beginning, I would choose uh, people differently. How do you choose them today? 
I mean, you said that you pay a lot of attention to culture, for example. How do you choose the people that should work for you? What's important to you? I heard uh, from a professor, professor at the University of St. Gallen that Microsoft introduced a system like a two-dimensional a normal matrix. So one uh, component, one dimension is the performance of people, one dimension is the culture fit. So I really like the idea because it's easy. So you can have criteria for performance. You define what performance means for your company and you define what culture fit means for your custom, uh, for your company. Can you give us both for like examples for both parts? What does performance mean at Advertima and what does culture mean? I mean, performance is not very difficult. So uh, the, the lead links of the company, the, the circles, they define what performance means for them. Okay. So um, it's, it's not very difficult, but on the culture part, that was fun. I mean, in the beginning, when we ask ourselves, ourselves what is uh, what are the criteria for this uh, culture dimension we started to discuss about what we want our culture to be so then we started with uh, fancy stuff i don't know what this this, this uh, startup culture um, definitions that we knew from the internet and theory mm -hmm. and that was basically where we wanted to go at some point but it was not really what we are so, but that's also not that easy to realize, I can imagine. It, we, it took us about six months right. because we realized um, this, this cri uh, criteria that we had from the cultural fit dimension, mm -hmm. it was very difficult to fit to those for me, for everybody, because that was not our culture. So at some point I realized, okay, maybe we have to just define what our culture is and try to bring in people who fit to our culture. So we already had a culture, but we thought we don't, we have a wrong culture or something like that, but that, that's not true. So we are not a typical startup where everybody after every day goes out and drinks beer and stuff like that. We are in a war. It's like that. We have a complex business model, complex product. We are always every day in a war. Or even though once a week we go out together, it's it's not that fancy stuff like everybody has, is coming to the office at 10 and at 4 in the afternoon you go drinking beer. It's not like that. It's uh, really a not, uh, different culture that we have. I, you know, I'm mentioning this because I know startups in Switzerland uh, who have this culture and it fits to them. It's okay. But for us, it, the definition was like, yeah, we need a really direct communication. Mm -hmm. So direct communication is much more important than political correctness and stuff like that. Okay. So defining these uh, uh, criteria um, was very important and we started to hire people who fit this criteria and it was really a game changer. So if you compare us, our team now with the team we had one and a half years ago, mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's really great what we have built. And how do you then test people? Like when someone comes for a job interview, for example, how do you test them? Whether they fit your culture? Do you have specific questions that you ask them? Or is that more of a gut feeling to you? How at do you some test point, it? At some point, I knew in the beginning of 2017, I hired uh, Nadia. She's our people and culture manager. And uh, Nadia is uh, very experienced. Uh, she came from Coca-Cola from a corporate basically, but we had good discussions about what is a startup culture and stuff like that. Okay. And uh, she, she is basically responsible for this. And she, has, um, she, has, she, she knows exactly what kind of questions to ask. So I stopped basically hiring people myself. I'm just the last guy who talks to people and they are filtered already very well. So every time, I think there was no case where somebody um, uh, had the first two interviews with Nadia and the uh, operational guys and uh, with me afterwards. And I had to say, no, this guy is not fitting, So they did, at least in the last year. They did a very good selection job for you in that case. Yes. And it's because we have really well-defined uh, criteria for culture fit. Do you know what questions Nadia asked in that case? Because I think this could be helpful to other startups that are not at this point where you are right now yeah. to then also think about, okay, if I know what my culture is, how can I actually test people on that? How do I find out if they actually fit? 
there is no perfect question. That's the point. So you derive the questions from the culture fit definition that you have. Okay. So we have 10 uh, criteria that um, if, um, derive from the culture that we have. Do you have an example that you can give us? Yeah, that is uh, the direct communication, for example, okay. or uh, this decide fast okay. is something that we have. Yeah. So um, there are a lot of people who talk a lot about problems. That's very important, of course, mm -hmm. but there is no decision coming. Right. It's like talking all the time, talk, talk, talk. We had a lot of people like that. And um, there are ways to test this. Okay. So I don't even have to do it because Nadia does a great job in that. Now coming back to the model of Microsoft that you mentioned, yes. there are like four different areas that people can fall into, right? If they perform well and if they are a good culture fit, they probably exactly yeah. where you so want them to have. What do you do with the others? This is what, what I really, really love about the system. Um, you have, you don't have to just go with gut feeling. You have real action uh, suggestions for action. So if you have somebody who is low performing and the culture fit is low, of course, don't hire this person or get rid of the person. Right. So uh, if you have high performance and uh, high culture fit, of course, this is um, exactly the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. But the other two spaces, uh, high performance and low culture, that's difficult, right? So the suggest suggestion is there and I really believe in it. Um, no, do not do not hire this person. High performance, low culture is not a, not a good um, fit because you can't really change the culture, at, at least not very fast. And if you have somebody who is um, uh, high performing, uh, no, low performing and uh, high culture fit, give this person um, one year, for example, and try to see if uh, the performance is um, getting higher. Of course, you support this person as well. Sure. If not, it's not the right person afterwards. Yeah. We have defined six months in our company. I think this is a, a very good model to, to follow and find some orientation about how to it's deal with people. It's fantastic. It's really working very well. Uh, cool. You also were in the news quite often, actually. And one specific article uh, was in Switzerland's largest newspaper where you were quoted as, you are the CEO that pays every employee the same salary. At a certain point, you stopped this, uh, but what led you to this decision to pay everyone the same salary? Because this is rather something unusual to hear. The big, in the beginning, it was just, we were four people, four founders, and uh, everybody was uh, working a lot. So uh, a lot of startups in the beginning, of course, say, okay, we are, we are going to have the same salary. Then when the next uh, employees, the first employees came into the company. We were just because of the reason that we didn't want to negotiate with anybody because we had a job to do. We already had a customer. And we said, okay, you know what? You earn the same money as we are earning. So the same salary for everybody until 10 people, we thought. But when um, employee number 11 was joining us, we said, okay, we don't have the time for that. So <laughs> it's working until now, the same salary, let's go on. So. Let's go to 15 people with the same salary. And in the end, it was 35 people. We were 35 people and everybody was earning the same salary. Some people in the interviews were somehow asking, is this working? And we said, until now it's working. So if it's, it's okay for you, you can join us, but you are going to earn the same salary as everybody else. And uh, the same salary that I am earning, for example. Right. So the engineers, for example, they were skeptical. They said, okay, this is not going to work out, but let's try it. I will join you. And uh, in the end, when we were 35 people in the end phase of early stage and um, in the beginning of growth uh, stage of a startup, mm -hmm. we realized that we need now really experienced people, senior people. So bringing in senior people in Zurich and Sangan as well, it's uh, not very cheap. So we had to go away from this um, standard salary system. Mm -hmm. And when we did so, the engineers in the end were the guys who said, okay, no, this is really a good system. We want to keep it. Okay, yeah. cool. 
that was uh, that that was really um, a change for them to see uh, that there is there, there are really good effects. We are uh, we also introduced holacracy to the company, but that was not a really good idea for a startup. Why not? The, a startup is led by visionary founders, and uh, not everybody is going to understand all the decisions. And Holacracy is basically giving um, each role the responsibility and also the power to decide stuff. Right. And sometimes when you are not clear about the strategy and the vision, and uh, there are a lot of fast changes, like you have in a startup, um, some decisions are not going to be good. So that was the reason um, we realized, one of the reasons we realized whole accuracy in a startup is uh, maybe not a really good idea. And you have uh, a lot of young people, unexperienced people, and they have to decide very over very, very important questions. Mm -hmm. So um, um, we decided to... Um, decrease the, uh, the whole accuracy grade to about 25%. Okay. And now that we have experienced people and we have a more better defined strategy and uh, proof of values and proof of concepts, um, we are uh, increasing it again. So also, if I understood that correctly, you, you basically shifted your hiring from junior people with not so much experience to really more senior people. And now such a system as Holacracy can work better in that environment than in the first one. Yes, if you have um, a clearly defined uh, strategy and you have really shown on the market that uh, there is a value that you deliver, mm -hmm. then you can, you can do some stuff differently. You can give more responsibility right. to, to the people and um, this is what we are increasing right now again. Okay. One important incentive a startup can also provide to its employees are stock options or direct stocks in the company. Mm -hmm. How did you manage this and what are your recommendations or success factors to make such an employee stock option pool uh, a success for the company and set the right incentives? Phantom stock options, but somehow it was, it was not really perceived as like, like real shares. Mm -hmm. So the effect was not what I expected. What, what did you expect? I expected the um, ownership feelings, okay. like uh, that people really um, care about this valuation of the company. And uh, that was very difficult for them to understand in the phantom stock option. So it was too it's abstract to, to grasp the concept or what it really means in practice. Even though they understood it, it was not the same feeling. Okay. It was not... We were talking about valuations and uh, next financing round will be this valuation and they could not uh, just directly understand and feel the effect on, on their shares um, or the options, the, the Phantom okay. stock options that they have. Um, anyways, we, we started to um, give away to key players, um, real shares, but of course vested over three years to certain milestones and stuff like that. And this is working much better, much better. Yeah. And how do you define key players? Do they have like... Uh, the matrix. The matrix, okay. So <laughs> everyone who's at the top right, high culture fit and high performance exactly. is a key player. Yeah. Okay. And on the right top of the right top okay. box, we have, we have the, the very, very special key, play, uh, key um, team members. Okay. But in that regard, I can imagine that you have to give out quite a lot of stocks, right? Not really. Okay. Not really. I mean, what we... Usually, startups have a pool of up to 10%, I guess. So what we have is 5%. But uh, we were able to raise our... Um, increase the, the valuation of the company very fast in the beginning okay. because we had these revenues coming from uh, the, the big customer and then afterwards uh, from other customers. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have a higher valuation, of course, the amount behind the shares, the amount of shares, the, the, the dollar amount right. is much higher. So you can play around a little bit. Just, I don't know if you're open to share, but I think this would also be very interesting how many people split these 5% of employee stock options or 
the, the real shares that you actually give out now? Mm. Just as a rough estimation. It's about between 20 and 25, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So just to give people an understanding about how much percentage the employees, the key players actually end up of a company. I think this is also important to understand from my perspective. Yes, of course. Um, there is basically in the, in the job interviews in the beginning, um, or in the end of the interviews, uh, when we talk about money, salaries, mm -hmm. and uh, we want to bring in very good people, the question that the calculation is uh, not very difficult. It's like, um, what is your expectation or what did you earn in your last job? And usually that's the double amount that, that you can pay. Right. And um, you, you then explain him that he will get the amount that we can pay to him in, in shares. So it's easy to calculate. So we said over the next two years, you will earn less. So this will be, let's say, 200,000 Swiss francs. And then he gets this amount of 200,000 Swiss francs as shares. Based on your That was, of course, just a yeah, yeah. example. Okay. And based on the last valuation of the company. Yeah. And then you vest the shares over three, four years, probably. Between two to three years okay. at the moment. But we, we don't just uh, take the time component um, into the calculations. It's uh, also, we, we give also milestones, like okay. annual recurring revenues of the company is the right. first milestone. So these are company milestones, not individual mi milestones or both? Company. Okay. Yes. That's, I think that's a very smart recommendation. Yeah, me too. <laughs> cool. I think we, we got a, a good insight view into Advertima and I'm also very curious about your future. So what can we expect from Advertima in the, in the future? What are your plans? Yep. I just told you uh, that in the beginning we were uh, putting tablets into taxis and today we are basically creating um, artificial intelligence that uh, visually interprets people in the physical space and um, makes the data on edge and real time accessible. So we realize at some point that, that uh, there is no technology at the moment on the market that can really deliver what we need. So we started to build it ourselves. And in the meantime, we do a really good job and uh, we, believe, we, we are more focused on this vision technology and um, and we, we are going to go global during the next uh, two to three years. And what you can expect from Advertima is that uh, we are going to be the company, the standard artificial intelligence uh, to interpret people in the physical world uh, in a visual way. Sounds like uh, a lot to come. And we're very curious to see what you will do with that. And it will be a lot of work, yes. I can imagine, yes. Before we conclude this episode, I would like to ask you two questions that we ask to every guest. Do you have any favorite tools or gadgets that you use on a regular basis? What kind of tools? Software? It could be software. It could be something that you use physically, like your smartphone, for example. Any tools or gadgets that you use on a regular basis that you can recommend? I mean, I could say mobile phone, of course, but that would be a boring answer, I guess. But I will tell you something it's it's a little bit embarrassing maybe but my my favorite tool is the task manager in outlook oh why is that the red flags yes you know? because that that organizes my life without that i would be really lost <laughs> cool. and usually uh, when i talk to people about this they are like what you use that yeah but but I am really doing that. And the last question for this episode, are there any additional resources like books, podcasts, blogs, whatever, that you can recommend to our listeners? Yeah, every employee and a new team member that we have in Advertima has to read two books. Okay. That's still the Lean Startup. Sure. Uh, it's a really good um, first book to read when, when it comes to understanding the difference between corporates and traditional businesses and startups. Mm -hmm. And the second book is uh, Crossing the Chasm. A very good one. Very good one, yes. Cool. Iman, thank you so much for taking the time and having a chat with us today. 
I really enjoyed uh, the session with you and I wish you all the best for the exciting future that's ahead of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of Swisspreneur. If you have any feedback or points we can improve, please let us know and send us an email to info at swisspreneur.com. If you liked what you just heard, please make sure to follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter at swisspreneur.org. See you next time. Thank you.